It's not lost on me that today is April the 1st, so I'm not going to come up with any April Fool jokes. If any of you are waiting for that, uh, you can go ahead and uh, put that away. Um, but uh, thank you for being here. Um, the, uh, the plan and sort of my intent for this summit, uh, one is to get it back on track from previous summits, but the other part of that, I know some of you have heard me say this and you've seen it in other areas, but uh, this summit to me uh, is an opportunity for the fire prevention community risk prevention folks. So you guys, inspectors, investigators, public educators, fire officials, to all have an opportunity to get in the same room and talk about some of the issues that face Virginia, uh, some of the concerns that we have, some of the topics that we're already dealing with locally in our own jurisdictions, and have a discussion about at the local level, state level, and even federal level about what Virginia needs to do and what we can sort of work through. And some of what you guys are working with at your local level, what the state's working with at the state level, and the resources we may have from the federal level. Um, the topics that we have uh, on your agenda today are the topics we had last year. And interestingly enough, they're still relevant today as they were last year. I know that we're all dealing with some other stuff. Uh, that's coming up with uh, food trucks from the new fire code that was adopted. And I know that there's some local ordinances that are being worked on and the state's working on some stuff. So you have some of these folks here today and you're going to have the opportunity to speak directly with them. And I think that's beneficial for all of us. I think that's going to help with sort of the communication piece and looking at what is important um, for the state and what we need to do uh, locally to help with that and then maybe even uh, try to engage your partners and your offices with the, uh, the work that's being done. So this is your summit. Uh, I'd like to see it become an annual thing. Um, uh, I think that there's a lot crammed into today that was kind of intentional, um, but I, there's a lot of topics to cover and a lot of information that we're going to try to get through today. So it, it's going to be a little bit of a long day, but I hope you bear with me and, uh, and hang in there. We're going to try to move through this. My goal is to keep everybody on track and uh, uh, make this as a uh, informative and, and, and entertaining as possible. Um, with that said, in your packet, you have a, um, uh, a survey. And I'm going to ask you to fill it out um, during the day whenever you, uh, you feel like you're at a point where you want to fill it out. Um, but when you turn it in, turn it in back to Tiffany and uh, Fran at the desk out here, and you'll get a, a, a ticket, and we're going to be giving away some door prizes. So we're trying to trying to initiate some feedback from you guys on what you think about today, what you got out of it, and if it's beneficial to you. Because like I said, I want this to be something that continues on from year to year. I think it's important that we do come together. Maybe it'd be more than once a year, but at least once a year. Um, not to take away from anything else that's going on with the IAAI and the BFPA and all that other stuff. That's not what this is for. This is for us to have a conversation about things that we need to work on locally and at the state level. Um, so please fill that out. Get it back out to the table. You'll get your uh, door prize ticket, um, and uh, and I think we've got some pretty decent door prizes. So uh, hopefully somebody will walk out of here with something that they can really use. But if not, you'll get something free for the event. Um, I, I want to also thank the team that put this together, and they've been working really hard for the last year, and you know I'm trying to re-pivot to get this um, you know rescheduled for today. So I'm going to ask a couple people to stand up. Um, Kim, right out, if you would stand up. And Steve Sykes, where you are. Fran <laughs> Thomas is outside at the front desk, so if you see her, please uh, you know, thank her. Tiffany Bradbury is out at the front table. She's with the Virginia Fire Chiefs as well. She's done a tremendous amount of work. Most of you that were at the Sound the Alarm Summit, I guess it's three years ago now. She was very instrumental in that. I know Kim was, I don't know Fran was. So I was very fortunate to be able to utilize their talents and their efforts. And so this could not be possible without their help. Um, there's uh, some vendors in the back that are sponsored and helped out with the, the planning and, and support financially and otherwise with this event. So when you get a break, uh, if you uh, take a walk through back there, there's some folks that uh, you might be interested in talking to. I'm not going to go down the whole list. It's in your, um, it's in your uh, program of all the supporters of the event. But uh, um, I'm not going to um, believe that anymore. Thank you for being here. Um, and I'm going to welcome uh, Chief Mike Riley. And I'm also going to have Chief Keith Chambers come up. And uh, Chief Chambers is going to 
uh, inter uh, uh, welcome you guys with uh, he's uh, with Chesterfield, and so I'd like to thank also just before he gets here Chesterfield for hosting this event and having this nice facility. So she came. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Thank you. On behalf of Chief Fire Chief Boyd Center, we appreciate you being here today. I'm Keith Chambers. I'm the Assistant Fire Chief for Chesapeake County Fire and EMS, and I oversee the community risk reduction uh, arena for our county, which involves a lot of sections and stuff, but it's kind of boring. Um, I, I really appreciate everybody being here today. I can't think of a better arena for everyone to come together and just talk about those issues that are affecting all of us in our communities and our state. Uh, I, I see the state fire marshal's office here. I see people driving to up from Williamsburg or over from Williamsburg, people down from Spotsylvania. What a great group of people to get together and just talk about those issues. I was looking at your lineup earlier today, and I said, oh, the first thing on the agenda today, fire fatalities and data. What better thing to have? <laughs> it's not that much of a speaker, I, I'm not sure, Brian. But here's the thing about it. The police department, they use data every day. They get more people and more items and things using data. And the thing about it is if they have data that shows that, shows that crime is going down, they get more police officers because they can show that crime is going down, so they need more police officers to keep crime down. If they have data that shows crime going up, guess what? They get more police officers because they have data that shows that crime is going up. Well, we need to use that same data to help us. We know fire fatalities are an issue. Now, on the surface, they'll tell you it's not. Because since 1980, the, the, the actual number of home fires has decreased by 53%, I believe it is. And that same time frame, 1980 to now, fire fatalities have decreased by 49%. So on the surface, sounds good, right? But the rate per 1,000 home fires, the fire fatality rate, has gone up by 4%. Home fires down, home fire fatalities are down, but the rate of fire fatalities has gone up 4%. What's going wrong? What is it? First thing we think about, smoke alarms, right? Well, we know 57% of the homes, of all those fire fatalities, do not have a working smoke alarm. That sounds good, but that means 43 or 47% do have working smoke alarms. So we need to drill down into those and find out what are the socioeconomics behind it? What's the housing stock? What's the community? What is it that is driving that rate of fire fatalities up by 4% since 1980? We know that most of the fire fatalities occur between 12 a.m. and 7 a.m. But that's only 17% of our fires occur at the same time frame. 17% of our fires occur overnight hours with 47% of the fatalities occurring at that same time. So that's what Brian's got to, he's got to pull all this together and get this data together so we can really drill down as a community of fire code officials and educators and public information officers and uh, fire marshals that we can determine what is the root cause for our problems. Next on the agenda, active shooters. What would, who, who would have ever thought 20 years ago we'd be talking about active shooters today? And we've talking rescue task forces and practicing with ballistic vests on. None of us would have thought that. Between 2016 and 2017, one year, we've had 50 active shooter or hostile type of violent incidents. That produced 943 casualties. Statistics tell us that 43% of those are going to occur in a commercial or business setting. 23% are going to occur in school. We focus on the school, but statistics are telling us we need to be focused on commercial and business. And then just on the, in the third spot, guess what? Government buildings. Guess what we all may have? Yeah, we need to be ready for these events. We need to look at the, uh, the statistics and the data in that and find out what, how do we need to practice and how do we need to get in there and, and solve some of the problems that we're seeing out there. It's not as easy as you think if anybody done any active shooting type drills, there's a lot of moving parts in there. Not the drill, just the actual event itself. How are you going to manage every parent in your community showing up at that school as soon as it hits social media that active shooting just occurred? We had a simple bomb threat the other day at a school, at a middle school I believe it was, a simple bomb threat. It hit social media, every parent came to pick up their child, everyone. How do you manage that? 
the accountability. And then you throw in an active shooter and casualties and fatalities. You have to think all the way around. 360 degrees on something like that. That's a major event. I think you're going to end your day now with uh, public education and youth fire setting. What a mainstay there. What a great ending. We have to change human behavior. If we're going to do anything in this world, we have to change human behavior. And what's the hardest thing to change? Human behavior. Yeah, we can engineer everything out. We can build everything in cinder blocks and fill it with water and never have a fire again. But we'll never change that human behavior. Uh, one, of, one of the things I've noticed is the fire service in general, we have so many messages. And they're all good, relevant, accurate messages. You know, stay low and go. Get out, stay out. Meet at the mailbox. Eat it. Exit drills in the home. Smoke alarm, stay alive. What's the newest one? Close your door. The problem I see is there's so many messages nobody grasps on the one. Smoking the Bear says, only you can. Look at that. We know that one. State police says, click it or. Now, why do we know them? But if I say the fire department says, oh, I don't want to shut the door. Smoke alarm, stay alive. We need to latch on to a good, strong, tenacious message and get it out there so people know. Whatever that message is, smarter people than me have to figure that out. But that's a good thing that we can come together and we can start presenting a message out there that's going to change that human behavior. And the good thing about human behavior, when we teach them young, they start to, they start to influence their circle of friends, their circle of influence. Get into the school systems, teach them young, they start to teach their brothers and sisters and parents. And as they grow older, they teach their children. And hopefully their, their children teach others. We can change that human behavior, we can change the world. Guys, I appreciate it. What a great event to come together for community risk reduction. Um, we can talk about all these issues affecting education, engineering, and enforcement, the three big E's in the uh, community risk reduction arena. There's two more E's there, if all you know it. Um, economic incentives and emergency response. So we change those things, we can start to look at this data and decrease our fire problem and our other risk problems that we identify in our community. Thank you so much. Enjoy your day. If you need anything from me, I'll be sitting at the table right in front of the camera there. Don't ask questions. Have a good day. Thank you. For those of you that don't know, Chief uh, Mike Riley, uh, Chief is the head of Virginia Department of Fire Programs, and uh, I asked him to come and speak to you guys. I know he's got some profound words of wisdom, so I'm going to just give him the mic and let him do his thing. Thanks, Captain Chesterfield. I don't think anybody has anything left to say. <laughs> <laughs> so there are a couple of things I'm going to start off with. Uh, first of all, thank you all for being here. I know on Monday, uh, on April Fool's Day, it's, it's really... Uh, track for a lot of people to kind of get down here. So uh, I want to thank you for your commitment and your professionalism for being here. Uh, but as an American veteran, um, and this is no disparage on anybody who sets this up, but I would like to start my events with a, a tribute to our country. So if I couldn't get everyone to just please rise and we'll do the pledge of I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If we remain standing, please just take a moment of silence for the men and women who have given the ultimate sacrifice. Thank you. Please keep them in your thoughts and your prayers. One more tribute. If I could have uh, any current, former, or active reservists for the United States military and all five of our branches, if you wouldn't mind standing and being recognized for your service. Thank you so much for your service. We couldn't be here without your sacrifice and your family sacrifice. So thank you. So everyone knows that uh, 2018, January, I was appointed uh, as the Executive Director of uh, the Department of Fire Programs. Uh, I come from a long history of public service. Uh, spent 37 years with uh, Fairfax County Fire and Rescue. I retired as the Chief Fire Marshal there in 2015. Was a volunteer before that, so I have over 40 years of service uh, in the fire service. 
I'm fourth generation. Uh, my father was a New York City police officer. Uh, my grandfather was a New York City police officer. And my great grandfather was a New York City firefighter. So, uh, long history of public service. Uh, I think all of our brothers in blue, gray, green, whatever you want to call them, brown, uh, and in the fire service, I think we have a, um, a sole source and, and really a, a, a goal in our life is to make a positive impact on the community that we serve. Uh, when I was called by Governor Northrop to uh, head up the Virginia Department of Fire Programs, I can honestly tell you it was not on my radar. I was looking at doing something a little bit lower profile. Um, the governor sat me down. We talked for about 45 minutes to an hour, and there were three things uh, that he wanted me to make an impact on. And I think it all has everything to do with the correlation of why we're here today. Because even though our job as community risk reduction officers, fire marshals, we're all here to try to make an impact on the number of fatalities that we have in our country. And of course, American Burning, back in the 70s, a big article, you know, killing 10,000 Americans in the United States from house fires. Uh, better construction, better code enforcement, better fire codes have all resulted in less than 3,000 American citizens dying each year uh, in the fires. Uh, and that is a huge, huge impact from the 70s to today. Uh, but the governor's three missions to me were, I want to make an impact on the line of duty deaths in the fire service. I want to reduce those numbers. I want to reduce the number of cancer exposures that we have each and every day in the fire service. And the last thing I want to make an impact on is mental health and preparedness from our men and women who are out there putting their lives on, on, on the streets every day. And I know you've heard me talk about this before, about the number of suicides that occur within the fire service. Last year, more firefighters in America committed suicide than died in line of duty. And men and women, if that doesn't tell you something wrong with what we're doing, and we're not educating the men and women that are coming into our fire service, the day of being Teflon bound and having all the stuff that we see each and every day kind of reek off of us, it doesn't affect us. That doesn't make sense anymore. The men and women who are picking this as a career are doing it because they're caring and compassionate people. And caring and compassionate people do not see a young child get burned to death and walk away unaffected. Does anybody here remember the first fatality that they ran? 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, Dickie, I'm not talking about you. Does anybody still remember that? By a show of hands, who remembers your first fatality? Everybody remembers that first fatality. And does it impact you? Do you think about it? We all think about it because we're caring, compassionate people. And so, over the last year since I've been appointed, we've had legislation that has passed that requires mental health education for every firefighter in the Commonwealth of Virginia. That's huge. We've had some great legislation that has been uh, passed over the last couple of years that are going to make our job a little bit better. Uh, we've changed in fire programs how we distribute our money. Everyone knows that my, my money, <laughs> ATL money, the A2 locality money, comes from the insurance industry. So we get 1% of every insurance policy that is written in the Commonwealth of Virginia on fire protection. We get that 1%. That equates to about $40 million. So $40 million off the top for insurance comes to fire programs. Why do you think the insurance company agrees with that? Why do you think they think it makes a positive impact on the fire service? And I know I'm preaching to the choir. Everybody here knows that the insurance company is probably going to save a lot more than $40 million. If we have better trained firefighters, firefighters that don't get injured or killed in the line of duty, firefighters who get there and have a half a million dollar house, and they only have $100,000 damage versus $500,000. So the insurance company is going to save on the end of their premiums because they think that $40 million is a drop in the bucket to provide better education to our men and women who put their lives on the line each and every day. So from that $40 million, $30 million of it is automatically turned back into eight localities to each one of your jurisdictions, the almost 739 fire departments in the Commonwealth. Everyone gets a minimum of either 10,000, 20,000, or based on their population, an, a numerate amount of money. And it goes from, like I said, the lowest jurisdiction gets 10,000, and the highest jurisdiction gets about 2.2 million. And again, this sole purpose is to train our firefighters on how to keep themselves safe and come home each and every day to their families, who kiss them goodbye, either each and every night or each and every morning. So that's important. 
When we talk about community risk reduction, we talk about some of the things that impact our lives. Now, I know our chief from Chesterfield mentioned here recently about active shooter. And so how is active shooter changing the way we do business? Well, <laughs> I'm going to give you a little update. So everyone is familiar with uh, Augusta County. Uh, last year, Augusta County went and uh, they had two elementary schools built. Those two elementary schools uh, requested uh, from their local building official a, uh, well, they requested a modification. Uh, and really the modification was designed to allow them to install supplemental locking devices on the inside of each classroom in each of those two elementary schools. And the building official, again, not including the local fire official, who just happens to be my state fire marshal, uh, he was not included in that decision-making process. The building official approved those modifications. The school was built with these uh, supplemental locking devices, which are locking devices that go on the bottom of the inside of the, uh, the door, and then bolt into the floor. I think it's about a two-inch hole that goes in and slides in. So that if you're trying to get in this door, even if it's locked from the outside, you're not going to be able to get in. Uh, the problem with that, of course, is it's against the fire code. All right, everybody here knows that you know you have to have a device that's 32 to 48 inches above the ground and has to open the door with what? One single action, correct? So we have this room. If it gets charged with smoke and superheated gases, the chances of them operating not with one device but two devices is probably going to be that much more minimal. So I remember back in the 40s and the 50s, I did my research. Um, how many kids were we killing in school fires? By the hundreds, right? 1958, I think it was a big one, uh, St. Mary's. Maybe, I know my fire marshal knows the number off the top of his head, but we were killing children by the hundreds uh, at each school fire. So the evolution of code development, code enforcement, reduced that to today. How many kids have we killed in school fires here recently? None, right? I mean, there might be some injuries, but are there school fires in schools though? Absolutely, right? We run them all the time. But our kids aren't dying because they are practicing evacuation drills. They all have smoke detectors. They all have sprinkler systems. And now, because we have an active shooter event, a threat, if you will, now we're going to double down on locking these kids in our classrooms. My concern, of course, is that our active shooters are coming into those classrooms and they're bringing incendiary devices with them. They're bringing Molotov cocktails with them. And fortunately, They've never been able to deploy those yet. Their whole goal, though, is to shoot and kill as many people as possible. And so here is my concern. If the 50 some odd active shooter events, has there been one active shooter that has gotten through a single locked door? One door compromised. Has anybody gotten through one? Anybody. Anybody know of anyone? Not one active shooter has gotten through a simple locked door. And I don't mean with supplemental locking devices. I mean just by locking the door. And why is that? Because they want to kill as many people as possible in a short amount of time as possible. So if they get a locked door, they go in on to the next open door. And yet our knee-jerk reaction as a society is to place additional locking devices in the school to lock our kids in when there might be a potential incendiary device displaced, right? put it to play, and now these kids can't get in. Of course, the other issue is that you may have a bad guy that wants to do bad to a kid or to a teacher inside that school. So they get in, and they basically deploy that device. Now, the law enforcement can't get in. Now, certainly there's a key to that. There's a tool that uh, can slide underneath the door. Uh, it's generally kept in the office. Uh, but does everybody know how to operate that thing? Does everybody know how to deploy it? And is there a way to overcome that? So I think those are things that have not yet been addressed, but I think they create a great concern for myself and local fire officials. So everyone knows that that event was, uh, our fire marshal wrote up a notice of violation for the Augusta County Schools. Um, they took it to the Technical Review Board. The Technical Review Board overturned the state fire marshal, predicated on that the fire, and, uh, the fire official cannot overturn or usurp the building official's authority and enforcing and giving that modification. In my humble interpretation, it was not a modification, it was a waiver. Because you and I know that if you're going to create a modification, you must meet the what? 
lines, the spirit and the intent of the code. And nowhere in the Augusta County event did I see that occur. They basically waived the requirement. So TRB's um, position on this event is that they are considered door hardware. Now we all know in Chapter 10 of the Building Code, building officials certainly has the right to regulate right, door hardware, correct? Does the building official have the authority to regulate supplemental hardware, locking devices? Anywhere in the building code does it say supplemental locking devices? Anybody look in there, Chapter 10? No, the place for you to find that is Chapter 10 of the Fire Code. Chapter 10 of the Fire Code talks about supplemental locking devices. Those are devices that are put in after the, the school is built, after the door is in place. It's what we call aftermarket events. Nowhere, in my humble opinion, does it say that the building official has the ability to regulate aftermarket events that are indoors. We call those supplemental locking devices. They're covered under Chapter 10. However, some members of the TRB, I'm not going to mention anybody's name, throw anybody under the bus, but they're out presenting this case to many of the builders around here, and they're saying that the TRB has overturned the fire service in the use of these supplemental locking devices. Therefore, the intimation, if you will, is that you can go ahead and use these. We've had a locality who received a notice of violation last year for use widening these devices. They complied and removed them. But ever since the TRB uh, ruling that occurred, they have now reinstalled them in their schools. And when we ask, hey, why did you do that? It's okay, our building official has gone over the state fire marshal's head, and now they're allowed to use them. And so our building official has given them a modification to use in a school that's already been built. I don't know how you get there. <laughs> but I think everyone here knows what the next step is after a notice of violation, when you willfully uh, disregard and notice of a violation. So my goal is to try to avoid that happening in everybody's community. So I've tried to meet with um, our uh, respective uh, members of the Department of Housing and Community Development, I met with their attorney, my attorney, my state fire marshal, and myself, to try and educate the localities that are looking at these, what they believe to be landmark cases. But if I ask everybody here, who are in code enforcement. If the TRB makes a decision, is that unilaterally now enforced throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia? The answer is <coughs> no. The answer is absolutely not. In fact, the Augusta County event specifically stipulated that this modification was approved for those two schools only because each case has to be reweighed on its own merits. So I just say that because there's many other devices that are out there that are creating some great concerns to us. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time on here because I know you have a full packed day, but I do want to make sure that everyone is aware that the TRB recommendation or decision is specific to the case that's before them, and it is not considered a landmark case. They are not the Circuit Court of Virginia. Uh, they're just dealing with one specific issue. And we've asked them to put that language on their website. So to remind these people, both localities and building officials, that because the decision is made by the TRB, unilaterally it doesn't come out and cover the rest of Virginia. So there are a couple of other things that uh, will pass this year through the legislation. I'll just hit that on and I'll pass it on to my boss because I know we're running on time. So the one other thing, uh, well two other things that were, were big in the legislation is we changed the definition of fireworks. Uh, thanks to Brian McGraw, my state fire marshal, really made it uh, so that it took out the name of devices that may or may no longer be manufactured. It's really designed to uh, reflect uh, the performance measurements of the firework. And we did that in conjunction with the firework community, APA and TNT. They all contributed to that definition, so there would have been no opposition to that at all. The other thing we changed was uh, redefine two positions on the State Fire Services Board. Um, as all of you know, in 2008, when the State Fire Marshal's office was transferred to Fire Programs, the Fire Marshal became an employee of the Director of Fire Programs. And so the Attorney General's office determined that having a board member be also an employee was a conflict of interest. And so we wanted to just double down on that technical expertise, so the State Fire Marshal remained as part of uh, the subject matter expert group on the board as part of staff. Uh, and now, instead of the state fire marshal being appointed, there will be a local fire marshal certified under Title 27 that will be able to fill those shoes. 
In addition, we all know that the International Association of State Fire Service Instructors no longer has a junior chapter, and so we changed that language to reflect a certified fire instructor within the Commonwealth of Virginia. So those two changes will be effective July 1st. So those are two big issues. So that's kind of my two cents. I'll be around here if anybody has any questions. I don't want to steal any more of uh, my state fire marshal's thunder, but thanks again for being here, and uh, we'll be around if you have any questions. So does anyone have any questions right now before I go? Yeah, I answered everybody's questions. Back to you.